Hello everyone and welcome to Surveillance Report 39, where we are dedicated to keeping you private and secure with the latest news. This report recaps some of the most notable events in the last two weeks. Yes, we unfortunately missed a week, so brace for a long one. This week we will be covering Experian's data leak, iOS 14.5, exciting news from both Signal and Session, and much, much more. I am Nathan from The New Oil. Henry was called away this week on an urgent mission to make the world a more private place and will be returning soon. This week we want to remind you that you can help make this project sustainable with a recurring donation on Patreon. One of the biggest challenges that projects like TechLore and Surveillance Report face is consistent funding, and you can help make sure that we stick around for the long haul with a recurring donation on Patreon. TechLore's Patreon offers the ability to to support the project for as little as a dollar a month and offers perks like private news feeds, stories, and Discord perks. And further levels will give you monthly live streams, which I have been known to attend in the past, sneak peeks of upcoming projects, merch discounts, and much more. You get a lot for a very small price in my opinion. With that said, let's go ahead and start off with data breaches. Our big story this week, Experian API exposed the credit scores of most Americans. So Experian is one of the three major consumer credit bureaus here in the US. There's also Equifax and TransUnion, and then there's a couple of smaller ones. A partner website, quote unquote, had an issue that allowed an attacker to look up the credit score of pretty much anybody by simply supplying the name and mailing address. It has since been fixed on this particular website, but the researcher who found it is worried that this may be present on other other websites that Experian has partnered with. The issue lies with Experian's API, which is a software that third-party websites can use to interface directly with Experian. They're very common softwares that a lot of companies use. In this particular case, it also showed four risk factors that explain why the score isn't higher. So this potentially exposes a lot of information. Fortunately, there is good news. A credit freeze will block this from working. I always say that if you're an American, you need to freeze your credit. Hard stop, no exceptions. Go freeze your credit right now. Google Play app still text and pepper you with unauthorized purchases. This is a story that's relatively common. There were eight malicious apps that have been removed from the Google Play Store after being discovered. These apps all together had over 700,000 downloads. They allowed for unauthorized purchases and particularly they hijacked your SMS notifications, which is always scary. The app stole carrier information, mobile number, SMS messages, IP addresses, country, network status, and in some cases they were able to get information about your auto renewing subscriptions. It is also worth noting that this particular malware made extensive use of JavaScript. JavaScript is really dangerous. You really need to be careful with it. If you're willing to put yourself through all the hassle, I would use a plugin like uBlock Origin or NoScript to block any unnecessary JavaScript. Next up, we're gonna move to Wyoming, where 164,000 residents mistakenly had COVID-19 and breath alcohol test results exposed on GitHub. The Wyoming Department of Health accidentally uploaded 53 files that contained COVID and influenza data and breathalyzer data onto GitHub. The data was online between November 5th of 2020 and March 9th of 2021. Lab data for the COVID stuff and the influenza stuff included patient names or IDs, mailing addresses, date of birth, test results, and dates of service. This information was taken down, but as always, we don't know if anyone has accessed that. On the topic of COVID, Pennsylvania's contact tracing app had a data breach that affected 72,000 people. Pennsylvania employed a third party company called Insight Global, and that company was responsible for managing Pennsylvania's contact tracing app. Employees of Insight Global are accused of being irresponsible in regard to, quote, security protocols and creation of unauthorized documents, unquote. As a result of this, the leaked data that was available for these 72,000 presumably Pennsylvania residents included sexual orientation, COVID exposure status, names, phone numbers, email addresses, genders, and ages. Another website called Paleohacks had the records of 70,000 customers exposed, as well as password reset tokens, so that's pretty serious. The data included full names, email addresses, IP addresses, login timestamps, locations, dates of birth, bios, profile pictures, hash passwords, fortunately hashed with bcrypt, and in some cases, reset tokens. This was due to an unsecured AWS bucket. It's been a while since we've heard from one of those, but welcome back. It is unknown if there was any unauthorized access, but again, always assume that there was. Fortunately, Amazon did secure this bucket once they were contacted. Unfortunately, the researchers had to contact Amazon Amazon directly, PaleoHacks never got back to them. This is kind of a big one for the privacy community. DigitalOcean had a customer billing data data breach. DigitalOcean is a popular choice in the privacy community when it comes to self-hosting on virtual private servers, which there are many, many reasons that you may choose to go with a VPS as opposed to self-hosting at home. In this particular instance, the breach took place between April 9th and April 22nd, so fortunately that's a relatively short window, and it included leaked names, addresses, last four of card numbers, expiration date, and issuing bank. 
They didn't disclose exactly how many users were affected, but they said that it was about 1% of profiles, and given the numbers that DigitalOcean revealed, I think about two years ago, that would put the number a little over 10,000, so pretty good chunk of people. They said the flaw that allowed for the data breach was fixed, but did not disclose what the flaw was or exactly what happened. We'll, of course, keep an eye on that, and if we hear anything new, we will update you guys. Popular insurance company Geico has also had driver's license numbers stolen. So once again, Geico, like DigitalOcean, did not disclose exactly how many people were affected. They did say that the data was accessible between January 21st and March 1st. We believe that there were at least 500 people affected because that's when, according to state law, they are required to file a notification and notify victims who were affected. I'm going to quote the article, information gathered from other sources was used to obtain unauthorized access for driver's license numbers through the online sales system on that third party's website, unquote. So once again, we see here where a third party system is the problem, and that's why you have to be careful when providing information to anyone because you don't know how they're going to store it. And furthermore, you don't know what third parties are going to work with. A lot of the time, companies are not very transparent with that. This is probably an effort to obtain unemployment benefits illegally because a driver's license number is a key piece of information you have to do that. There's a popular technique called planting your flag. I totally recommend this. It's when you go to, for example, the unemployment website, you go ahead and create an account, even if you don't plan to file unemployment, so that way nobody else can do it on your behalf. That especially became a really important thing after the pandemic started because of all these fraudulent benefits being filed in people's names. First Horizon Bank has had several online accounts hacked and customer funds drained. First Horizon has hundreds of banks in 12 states in the Southeast US, and they offer banking, capital market, and wealth management services. They say that less than 200 accounts were breached using previously stolen credentials and by exploiting a third party security software vulnerability. So once again, we see that third party thing. We also see again, the previously stolen credentials, which means these credentials were out there after an existing data breach. And quite frankly, if they knew that and they didn't have credentials changed, shame on them. So in total, less than a million dollars were stolen and fortunately customers were reimbursed. And I'm sure it was a headache, but at least they got their money back. I wanna highlight that because there's a lot of discussion in the privacy community about why banks suck because they're constantly selling your information and they're centralized and all the problems with fiat currency and government and all that kind of stuff, which I totally agree with. But this story does illustrate that there are certain advantages to banks. It is never a good idea to take your money and store it under a mattress because if you get robbed or your house burns down or anything like that, that money is just gone. I don't recommend using debit cards and credit cards. I totally recommend using cash or cryptocurrency if you live in a, a place where that's a feasible, realistic thing. Banks are not great for privacy, but they are great for protecting your money, at least up to a certain amount. And our last data breach. Android contact tracing apps were leaking sensitive data. So it turns out that Google's contact tracing apps for Android were storing their data in the system logs, which are not always, but often are accessible by certain apps for analytic purposes and crash reports. The exact number of apps varies from device to device. Overall, in total, this applies to hundreds of apps, at probably a couple hundred at least, maybe even more. Google claims that they are in the process of fixing this is issue and rolling it out. All right, let's move into companies, and we're gonna start off talking about Flock yet again. We've covered that the past couple episodes. It is Google's attempt to replace cookies with something that is supposed to be more privacy respecting, but in reality, it's really not. It still lets Google track you. It just puts a middleman between you and advertisers, which is Google, so they benefit and everybody else loses. Flock is failing, at least according to Wired. <laughs> and quite frankly, I agree with them. Maybe it's my perspective, but from where I'm sitting, it looks like this is not going over very well. Regulators are really concerned about Flock from an anti-monopoly perspective. Meanwhile, there are numerous popular websites that are disabling it from all levels of the internet, big companies, small companies, everybody, everybody's disabling Flock, nobody likes it. Two examples that just came out this week, WordPress has said that they're probably gonna start disabling it by default, and GitHub just announced that they're disabling it on their website. Speaking of Google, Roku has pulled their support for the YouTube TV app and says that Google wants special access to data and that's why they're they're doing this. So Roku has let their contract with YouTube TV expire, claiming that Google wanted, quote, unfair and anti-competitive requirements that would allow for the manipulation of your search results, impact the usage of your data, and ultimately cost you more, unquote. 
Roku is claiming, specifically, they're claiming that Google demanded the ability to dictate certain hardware used in Roku devices, that they asked for special access user data, and quote, when a user has the regular YouTube app open, Google wants Roku to block search results from other third-party video streaming apps like Netflix, Disney+, Plus, etc., unquote. Google is, of course, refuting these claims. They're saying that's not true, except the hardware one. They said that is true, and that one was, quote, to ensure a high-quality experience on YouTube, unquote. If you have YouTube TV and you like it, don't delete the app because you won't be able to re-download it, but it will still continue to function as long as you have it. Amazon is continuing to expand their one palm scanning payment platform. This story started about a year ago, maybe two. Basically, Amazon introduced what they're calling Amazon One in specific stores in Seattle, specifically Amazon Go and Amazon Books. They are now expanding it to Whole Foods, also in the Seattle area. Amazon One is a palm-based biometric payment system, so you just put your palm on the thing. Personally, I wouldn't trust Amazon with my biometrics. They are extremely, extremely invasive. Right, let's talk about Apple now. iOS 14.5 rolled out this week, and we've been talking about this a lot. I think we've been talking about this a lot. I've certainly been reading about this a lot. Basically, 14.5 has this new feature where apps have to flat out ask you if they can individually track you and you are allowed to say no. Now, if you're like me and you don't wanna be tracked at all, you can disable this completely. Go to settings, privacy, tracking, allow apps to request to track, and then turn that off. And that will disable any app from ever asking you and it will disable them from being able to individually track you. Now, of course, you should know, this will not make you totally private. There will still be some general analytics and there's other ways to track users like browser fingerprinting and stuff like that but this is a great step and it will go a long way. And furthermore, to prove that they are serious, Apple says that they will ban any apps that are trying to get around this. So basically, if Apple finds any apps that are attempting to circumvent, they're calling this the App Tracking Transparency, ATT, they'll get banned. So apps that say, um, you know, we'll pay you if, if you allow us to track you, apps that say, uh, that give you like a fake, question like you know they'll give you the pop-up but it's not real it's just fake and it doesn't matter what you hit if any app gets caught doing anything like that they will get removed from the app store disney viacom and 10 other advertising technology companies have agreed to remo remove certain advertising software from children's apps developers will still be able to show contextual ads based on the app's content so basically general ads but they can no longer track children mastercard has purchased digital identity firm ikata for 850 million dollars Ikata provides APIs for a bunch of different industries, and they use AI to enhance, quote, risk scoring, indicators, and data attributes, unquote. Biased opinion, obviously. Basically, Ikata uses AI to make social credit scores. MasterCard got their hands on this company in order to enhance their own security and verification in order to prevent fraud as we move into an increasingly digital age. For the record, we're talking about things like facial recognition, um, biometrics, stuff like that. On the topic of banks, U.S. banks are deploying AI to monitor customers and workers. So I'm going to quote the article here. Several U.S. banks have started deploying camera software that can analyze customer preferences, monitor workers, and spot people sleeping near ATMs. The article says that widespread deployment of such visual AI tools in the heavily regulated banking sector would be a significant step toward their becoming mainstream in corporate America. One uh, cyber officer said that Face Unlocked paved the way. Quote, we've already leveraged facial recognition on mobile. Why not leverage it in the real world? Unquote. So this, in my opinion, this demonstrates mission creep, which is how technologies can be expanded to go from their original use to new cases. Originally, face unlock was to unlock your phone. Now they're saying, well, why don't we use this technology for other things? It's important to be aware that technologies that we discover today that are used for one thing today could be used for something completely different tomorrow, which is why we have a whole section on research on this podcast. Critics are pointing out how much facial recognition sucks and all of the other issues that could come with this move, particularly retaining, pertaining to privacy. And finally, this is a little bit of a data breach. There was a password manager called Password State, which appears to have had a backdoor and 29,000 users were compromised. So Password State is a proprietary password manager but it was audited for the record. The 29,000 users downloaded a malicious update. So the, the attackers pushed out an update that was disguised as a serious update. And when it was installed, it stole user data. This story highlights a couple of things. First of all, it highlights the risk of supply chain attacks, which we are seeing more and more, which unfortunately for average users like you and me, there's not much we can do about them. If Bitwarden tells me that it has an update, I trust that Bitwarden has an update. And I say, okay, cool, update. I, for one, am always pushing 
the importance of updates. But if that supply chain, if that update upstream is compromised, the, man, there's nothing I can do about that. Secondly, it also illustrates the risk of a single point of failure. Using Bitwarden as an example, Henry and I are both fans of Bitwarden and, and we think it's great for 99% of people, but it is important to note that you, when you've got all your passwords in a single place like that, especially when it's online and in the cloud like that, that is a single point of failure. So it's important to, for example, with Bitwarden, use a strong master password. Uh, you know, check your hashes when you're downloading something and updating something whenever that's an option. Two-factor, you know, if, if all your passwords get stolen and you've got two-factor, you're still in the clear. Although you should change your passwords as soon as you're aware. A lot of important lessons from this story. All right, let's move into research. Computer scientists discover a new vulnerability affecting computers globally. So do you guys remember uh, Spectre from, I wanna say it was about two years ago? Well, basically, it's back. Uh, for those who uh, were not around for that, Spectre was a huge, huge, huge deal. Uh, you know, for weeks, the technological world was basically hair on fire running around trying to fix it. Spectre was a flaw that was built into, I believe, Intel processors that basically allowed an attacker to abuse what's called speculative execution. Speculative execution is a technique that allows modern computer processors to be so fast because basically what it, do, what it does is the processor tries to predict what instructions it might end up getting. And so it prepares by basically following multiple instructions at once. It's, it's almost like a quantum thing, you know, how like the cat is both alive and dead. For those of you who have no idea what I'm talking about, look up Schrodinger's cat. That's basically what your processor does, is it runs multiple processes at once, and then once you execute, it gets rid of all the other ones, focuses on that one, and then runs a new set of processes to prepare. Spectre basically tricked the processor into executing instructions on the wrong path. Even though the processor can recover and complete the task correctly, hackers can still access confidential data when the processor is going down that other path. That is a grossly oversimplified way of putting it, uh, as the article summed it up. So in this new attack, researchers found a way to exploit something called a micro-op cache, which speeds up computing by storing simple commands and allowing the processor to fetch them quickly. So it's kind of like a, um, a really light version of speculative ex uh, execution. Rather than trying to predict this whole chain of events, it just holds on to a few simple commands and has them ready. And unfortunately, Attackers can steal data when the processor fetches the command from the micro-op cache. This unfortunately bypasses all the mitigations that the tech community has spent years putting into place for Spectre because it happens so early on in the process, it kind of works around all that stuff. Our next story is a really interesting proof of concept. Animal DNA can be collected from air sampling. I'm just gonna read one sentence from the, uh, the abstract. Here we demonstrate that eDNA, which is environmental DNA, can be collected from air and used to identify mammals. This is aimed at environmental uses like conservation and monitoring of animals in the wild. There's probably not much we can do about it other than walking around in a full like hazmat suit, but it's worth knowing about and it's worth having on your radar. And remember what I said just a minute ago about mission creep. Even though right now this is being used for environmental purposes, it is entirely feasible that this could be deployed into other situations in the future. I mean, I can already think where the police will come in to a bank robbery that happened 30 minutes ago and deploy this technology to scoop up the DNA of everyone who's been in the bank for the last hour. And then of course, from there, it's just going to snowball out of control. Like I said, I'm not saying that will happen. I'm just saying I, I can see how that creep can happen. Researchers at the University of Würzburg in Germany, I probably screwed that up, I'm sorry, have found huge issues with contact discovery in various messengers, especially secure messengers. So I'm gonna quote the article here and then try to explain this as best as I understood it. Using an accurate database of mobile phone number prefixes and very few resources, we have qu queried 10% of US mobile phone numbers for WhatsApp and 100% for Signal, which is worrying. For Telegram, we find that its API exposes a wide range of sensitive information, even about numbers not registered with the service." Unquote. In addition, they also found that most users don't change the default settings. So basically what happens here is that many messengers will retain a copy of the user's address book to check if a contact joins in a future date. When you join, say, Signal or WhatsApp, they'll ask you, you know, hey, do you wanna check and see if any of your friends are on Signal? And you say, sure. And so basically what that does is it will upload your contact list and they'll say, hey, these are all the people that are on Signal and they'll retain a copy so that if six months down the road, one of your friends joins Signal, you'll get the message that says, hey, your friend's on Signal. Now services like Signal, they do hash the phone numbers in order to protect user privacy. So they don't have direct access to those phone numbers. However, this paper says that phone numbers are low entropy, 
meaning it's pretty easy to brute force them. I mean, you know they're all numbers, and you know that they're, in the US case, they're, what, 10 digits long? So that kind of narrows down the amount of brute forcing you have to do pretty freaking easy. Furthermore, there is no rate limit, rate limiting on contact searches, meaning a malicious actor can basically just keep searching an infinite number of phone numbers over and over until they find people who are on the list. The article goes on to propose a few uh, solutions that can be used to mitigate this. Most of them are on the technical side and have to be implemented by the uh, providers. Hopefully those will be rolled out so that we can make this a little bit more secure in the future. Let's talk about Apple again real quick. Apple's airdrop shares more than files. <laughs> So once again, I'm gonna quote the article. As sensitive data is typically exclusively shared with people who users already know, AirDrop only shows receiver devices from address book contacts by default. To determine whether the other party is a contact, AirDrop uses a mutual authentication mechanism that compares a user's phone number and email address with entries in the other user's address book. So in other words, AirDrop, for those who don't know, is a, a way for Apple users to wirelessly send files back and forth. So by default, AirDrop only works with devices that are in your address book. You you have to like basically go find the other device. And in order to determine whether or not you're a mutual contact, they kind of use like a hashing comparing of the address books. Basically, the researchers in this article found that an attacker could learn phone numbers and email addresses of any AirDrop user so long as they were within physical proximity. So that is the plus side. You have to be physically close to each other. The basic premise is that the address book hashes are weak when, when they're doing that mutual authentication part. So they can be very easily brute forced. The researchers say that they informed Apple about this all the way in May of 2019 and still have not heard back. There has been no indication that Apple is working on a solution. The researchers even created a solution called Private Drop that had a latency of, I believe they said less than one second or less than one millisecond maybe. So basically they found a solution that'll work for just about everybody and greatly reduces the risk of this. You just gotta improve the hash from what I understand. Just be careful if you're an Apple user and you use AirDrop that uh, it is not incredibly secure. I would say, as with anything, turn it off when you're not using it. Another real quick Apple story, a software bug lets malware bypass OS's security defenses. So fortunately, this is a proof of concept. I, I don't believe that we've seen it in the wild. Apple just recently patched this, this bug, so it is fixed if you keep updated. Malware could, in theory, bypass Mac defenses just by double-clicking the app to install it, which is supposed to be impossible with Mac. Apple puts a lot of work into making their devices very, very secure. So the idea of double clicking it to install it, at very least, it's supposed to pop up with a message that says, hey, we can't verify that this is not malware. So if you wanna run this, you have to go to the settings and manually enable this. It's supposed to prevent you from accidentally installing malware like this. So a researcher submitted a proof of concept that you know he found a way that you could do it. Apple pushed out the update with macOS 11.3, and they also updated the anti-malware rules on Xprotect, which is Mac's built-in antivirus. The ISC is urging updates of DNS servers to wipe out a new bind vulnerability. Researchers have found three vulnerabilities in DNS systems, specifically bind 9, which is a widely used open source DNS project. I actually ran updates today, and I noticed that everything updated bind 9. So thank God this is starting to roll out. Essentially, bind is totally fine in the default state. However, it is often used in situations like enterprise situations where it gets integrated with other projects. So that means it is rarely used in the default state. And once the configuration has been changed, there's a lot of vulnerabilities that open it up to buffer overflow attacks, remote code executions, and other stuff. Fortunately, fixes are underway. Like I said, I got mine this morning. Just keep your devices updated. Microsoft has found memory allocation holes in a range of IoT and industrial technology devices. Microsoft has a group called Section 52, which is the research group for Azure Defender for IoT. And they found a batch of bad memory allocation operations in the IoT code that compromises devices. Basically, there is an issue related to improper input validation, and then it just snowballs from there. As with a lot of this stuff, I'm not gonna lie, it kind of went over my head a little bit, like I, I understood the basics of it. Basically, there's a way that when you're doing a certain type of input, you can trick it, and like I said, it just snowballs from there. That's how I understood this. Microsoft is working with the Department of Homeland Security to alert all the vendors and patch devices wherever possible. Agricultural equipment giant John Deere has a vulnerability on their website that allows an attacker to harvest customer names, addresses, and detailed information on the equipment they operate, including device hardware and software information. Basically, this researcher found that 
he could play with John Deere's website and basically get a map of customers and what equipment they have and what hardware and software versions they're running. This is a huge attack vector now on farming and agricultural, which needless to say, this is a really big deal. This is like a nation state deal because now you're talking about hitting people in their food supply. We haven't heard back from John Deere yet, but hopefully they will take this very seriously and fix this as quickly as possible. And our last story is actually kind of a clickbait story. That's why it's here and not in data breaches. The headline says, brace yourselves, Facebook has a new mega leak on its hands. Eh, it's more of a proof of concept. So a researcher demonstrated a tool and it is unclear if he made it or if he found it, but basically he has a tool that could link as many as 5 million Facebook accounts to a list of known email addresses in a single day. So this researcher can go out, get a list of email addresses, which of course those are available all over the place these days with all these data breaches that we cover every single week and use this tool to check those email addresses against Facebook and see if there's a Facebook account and who that Facebook account is. All right, let's move into politics. We're gonna start with a kind of big story that drew a weirdly conflicted response from my readers personally. The US Postal Service is running a quote, covert operations program that monitors American social media posts. Basically, USPS was secretly crawling social media looking for any quote unquote inflammatory posts mainly those involving protesting. And then they pass that along to the appropriate government agency, whether that's the FBI, local police, etc. Of course, ostensibly, this program is to prevent uh, any sort of uprisings, uh, another January 6th, national security, all that fun stuff. A lot of people were really curious, like why USPS? Why not like the FBI or the NSA or the CIA or literally anyone else? And of course, this does raise a ton of privacy concerns. An update to that, just I just saw today, House Republicans have actually introduced legislation to defund this program. At least some people in the government are not happy with this and they do see this as a violation of privacy and are attempting to do away with it. EFF has released a new public records collection regarding California's use of automated license plate readers and quote, how very little of this surveillance is actually to an active public safety interest, unquote. In other words, EFF has uh, collected usage information from California's police regarding automated license plate readers and found that it's basically useless. I'll quote the article. In 2019 alone, just 82 agencies collected more than 1 billion license plate scans using automated license plate readers. Yet 99.9% of this surveillance was not actively related to an investigation when it was collected. Nevertheless, law enforcement agencies stockpile this data often for years and often share the data with hundreds of agencies around the country, unquote. Let's talk about an international issue real quick. China has hacked the US. <laughs> There's not much to say at this point in time. A Chinese cyber espionage program compromised Pulse VPNs, which is an immensely popular VPN service for a variety of state and private entities. So as more people are working from home, of course, this is a really big deal. It's such a big deal. In fact, the CISA has issued some of their strictest emergency mandates that they have to find and fix impacted users. We're gonna keep an eye on this as this unfolds. This could be the next SolarWinds Microsoft Exchange thing, or honestly, it could be nothing. It's too early to tell, but we'll keep an eye on it. All right, so here's a pretty simple story from ZediNet. Basically, there's a big push. Right now, it's mostly in Europe, but I'm sure it's uh, if it hasn't already started spreading to other places, it will soon, to make lampposts smart and use them for everything from Wi-Fi and measuring air quality to enforcing social distancing. I mean, it kind of makes sense. You know, you got a bunch of lampposts sitting around the city. They're not moving. They're not going anywhere. The infrastructure is already there. Why not slap a couple of sensors on them? But of course, there are privacy implications, especially as the pandemic is in many parts of the world starting to draw to a close. More and more people are getting vaccinated. For example, we have these cameras for enforcing social distancing. Well, once there's no longer social distancing, we're still going to have all these cameras that we spent millions or billions of dollars to put into place. We got to use them for something. We'll uh, keep an eye on that. We have another quick story. The headline basically says it all. It says court chides FBI, but reapproves warrantless surveillance program. The FISA court, who I'm sure many of us have heard about, it's Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. It's supposed to be the group that oversees all these like uh, surveillance programs, but they've been accused of rubber stamping everything and just kind of just basically making all the surveillance legal instead of actually keeping it in check. The judge from the FISA court, or one of the judges, has actually agreed that the FBI regularly oversteps their bounds and operates illegally in regards to surveillance, like reading NSA emails without a warrant that were illegally or collecting them illegally in the first place. It also straight up says that we can't even tell if surveillance is working, but they're gonna go ahead and like approve the program for another year because they're claiming they can't tell if it's working because the pandemic 
personal opinion, that's a freaking lie. We all know it doesn't work. They're just using that as a cop out. And then our last political story, this one is, uh, this one had a twist. So a ransomware gang threatened to expose police informants in Washington, DC. They stole over 250 gigs of files, so they claim, and that included investigative reports, officer disciplinary files, documents on local gangs, mugshots, and administrative files. The group initially said that the police had three days to pay the ransom or else they would contact all the local gangs and out all of the informants. I was searching for an update to this story because it, it originally broke on April 26th, and I was like, well, that's way past the, uh, the three day mark. I found an article that says that the group abruptly closed up shop with no warning or explanation. And just, they were like, ah, you know what, we quit, we're out. I don't know what happened there. Maybe they got caught or, uh, man, I don't know. That is, uh, I wish Henry was here so we could speculate on that together because that was a twist that I was not expecting. Personally, I'm gonna put my money on they probably got caught. And with that plot twist, let's go ahead and move into FOSS, free and open source software. And we're gonna start off talking about Signal. We had a couple of really interesting and amusing stories from Signal this week. Let's start with the first one. Signal hacked Celebrite, to put it simply. Celebrite is one of the world's leading digital forensics companies. Whenever a shooter has an iPhone and the cops say, Apple has to build in a back door, and then Apple says no, they go to Celebrite. Moxie, the founder of Signal, he claims that he came into possession of a brand new kit from Celebrite purely by coincidence and immediately started examining it. And he found that their software is basically trash. He claims that it is just riddled with vulnerabilities. And one of the most interesting ones that he disclosed was the ability to modify reports, including future reports from scanned devices without detection, which really calls into question the integrity of Celebrite devices. He also found some indication of copyright violation when it comes to Apple software and installers. I'm gonna keep an eye on Celebrite and see if they respond to that at all. Our next Signal story is a real quick one. A grand jury subpoenaed Signal for user data and Signal didn't have anything to show them. A California jury said, we need this user information as part of this court case. And the only thing that Signal had for them was quote, Unix timestamps for when each account was created and the date that each account last connected to the service. There's always a lot of debate in the privacy community about whether or not a service actually keeps logs and whether they're lying to us. In my opinion, these kinds of documents are the best way to tell because if Signal is lying and they actually do have user information and the government finds out about it, which they will, the repercussions will be unimaginable. They can't get away with that. When companies get core orders for user data and they don't have anything to turn over like this, this is a good indication that a company really is zero knowledge and really is not collecting user data and is not logging anything. That's a really good thing to know that Signal under oath had nothing to turn over. That's a point in Signal's favor. Just to make it clear, I know we've said this before, I'm not saying Signal's perfect. I'm just saying that is a good indicator that Signal is in fact, to some extent, respecting user privacy and not logging user data. Let's talk about Signal's competitor, Telegram. Telegram is suffering from a new remote access Trojan called Toxic Eye that has now been seen in the wild in over 130 recorded attacks in the last three months. So this Trojan primarily relies on phishing to spread, but once it's installed, it does the usual. It scans and steals your credentials, operating system data, browser history, clipboard contents, cookies. It also has the options to delete files, kill processes, hijack task management. It can deploy key loggers. It can compromise mics and cameras, and it can also turn into ransomware. So this is a pretty impressive guy. And the lesson here is the usual, don't click on familiar links, especially on mobile devices. We have a sad story this week about Linux. Linux has a backdoor. It is called Rota Jakiro, and it has been around for a while. And it's sad because we love Linux and we never claim that Linux is perfect, but it still sucks when you get reminded. <laughs> So this was a backdoor that specifically targeted 64-bit Linux systems. It stays hidden via a really complicated rotation of compression and encryption algorithms. Uh, from what I understand, it's basically always staying on the move to avoid detection, which is kind of genius and kind of scary. At the time that this article was posted, we're really not sure what this thing does. It, it doesn't seem to have delivered any kind of payload or do anything, but it does seem to be controllable from a remote server. So it's possible that this may be um, something where just the conditions haven't been met or the attackers haven't activated it yet. I've heard some people say that it requires physical access to your device in order to be installed. So 
hopefully this is not a huge deal. And again, at this time, it doesn't seem to do anything, but it could do something in the future. Just be on your toes and remember Linux is not a magic bullet. All right, we have some really good news about Session. Session has been audited and passed their audit. The session is cryptographically secure. The audit found a total of 16 issues. Uh, some of them were fixed during the audit, like as the audit was happening, Session was finding these issues and fixing them independently. There were nine issues remaining. Only one issue was marked severe, and that was one of the issues that had been patched. Of the nine remaining issues, which were not severe, the session says that many of them were intentional designs, like uh, the inability to take screenshots or the inability to copy a recovery passphrase to a clipboard. Yeah, session passed their audit, which is great news. That's another point for session. Congratulations to session. And then just a really, really quick fun story. The uh, helicopter on the Martian rover is fueled with open source software. And uh, I think we discussed a couple weeks ago that the actual rover itself is too. They're both running a, a version of Linux, and that's awesome. We have open source software on Mars, and it is powering space exploration. Go open source. We have a couple quick stories about Mozilla. So first, the good news. Mozilla will remove Lean Plum tracking from Firefox for Android and iOS. Lean Plum was Mozilla's third-party marketing manager. The contract will expire on May 31st, and Mozilla has chosen not to renew. This is good because if you read this article and it talks about all the different data that Lean Plum collected, it's a lot. And of course you have the option to opt out, but it is not a good look for Mozilla. Unfortunately, there is still a lot of other telemetry they need to get rid of like Google telemetry. So it's a start. I hope they'll keep fixing it. Another good piece of Mozilla news is that Firefox 88 now combats window.name privacy abuses. So window names are used to allow hyperlinks to target specific windows. For example, a nav bar on a website may change the content in a certain window so that your browsing is faster because then you don't have to reload the entire site. That might be more of a frame thing, but the basic principle is the same. Previously, this window name property could be abused to track users as they browse each site because the window could potentially have a unique name or identifier. Kind of think of it like the uh, HTTP refer that we talked about before, where like you click a link on DuckDuckGo and it says, oh, you came here from DuckDuckGo. It's kind of like that. Fortunately, uh, Firefox 88 is now going to crack down on that and make that one less way that you can be tracked. Unfortunately, in Firefox 88, they will enable JavaScript in PDFs by default. JavaScript, we mentioned earlier, is a huge risk. It is a huge threat. I do not recommend JavaScript. You certainly don't need it on in a PDF by default. So I would disable this. The way you do that is you go to your about config and you type in pdfjs.enable scripting and then disable that. Last piece of Mozilla news, Mozilla VPN is now available in Germany and France. Not much to say there. Mozilla VPN is basically just a browser specific uh, front end for Mulvad. So personally, I would recommend just going for Mulvad. It's a great VPN. And then two quick Linux stories. Canonical has released Ubuntu 21.04 and Fedora Linux 34 has officially launched. And finally, let's move into our Misfits section. We're gonna talk about millions of web surfers that are being targeted by a single malvertising group. So malvertising is malicious advertising, which is one of many reasons I think that you should use an ad blocker online, make yourself a little bit safer. A certain group of cyber criminals have compromised over 120 ad servers in order to display malicious advertising to tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of devices. The group has infected, infected servers running Revive, which is an open source app for self-hosting an ad server. I do kind of got to point out, just as we said with the Linux backdoor above, this just shows that open source does not always mean safe by default. Open source is a good thing. Open source is a great thing. And generally speaking, it means that there is the potential to be safer. It is not a guarantee. Anyways, last year, the group was targeting desktop devices. Now they're targeting phones. The ads are mostly for fake security devices, uh, security safety, VPN apps, things like that, and mostly with hidden subscription costs. So the idea is to make you download this fake VPN that charges you. The moral of the story, only trust vetted apps, don't trust random apps you've never heard of, and dis disable JavaScript if you can, because of course many of these ads are using JavaScript. Okay, our next story. Thank you to the listener who tipped me off to this story, because this is a big one. Dark.fail and darknetlive.com domains have been hijacked. Dark.fail and darknetlive.com, they are sites that list some popular Onion domains for a variety of purposes. There's marketplaces, there's news sites. I know Darkfail even has like the CIA's site and stuff like that. It appears that the sites were originally hosted on Nijala. Somehow, through methods that are not entirely clear at this time, the sites were hijacked and transferred to Namecheap. 
And this is despite the existence of two-factor, and I'm assuming these guys know what they're doing and they were using strong passwords. So maybe it was a, a phishing attack? I don't know, the owner hasn't really speculated and I'm not willing to speculate. At this point in time, the owner doesn't expect that they're gonna get those domains back. I don't know what they're gonna do about that. Do not use those sites anymore because all the links have been replaced with phishing links. Oracle Vice President Ken Gluck has been suspended by Twitter for doxing a reporter. A reporter for The Intercept posted a story about how Oracle was indirectly working with the Chinese government via resellers. The vice president of Oracle responded with a 2,700 word rebuttal and then asked followers to send him any information that they had about the reporter to his Proton Mail. When she saw this, she like retweeted it and made a joke about like, oh, he wants to hear from his followers. And then he responded to that tweet with a phone number and email that he was alleging were hers and thus got suspended for 12 hours and the tweet was deleted. Fortunately, the reporter claims that the phone number and email were not accurate. So privacy matters, man. You never know who you're gonna piss off. I'm sure this lady has written many articles like this before without issue, and you don't even have to be a reporter. You just never know when you're gonna say something. You never know who's gonna see it, especially when you post something public like that. All right, and then we got just a last handful of stories I'm gonna shoot through real quick. Ransomware gangs are trying to short stock prices of their victims. I wish Henry could be here to talk about this one because this is really clever, and he said before that he likes it when uh, criminals do clever things. I'm just going to quote the article. The Dark Side crew said it is willing to notify crooked market traders in advance so they can short a company's stock price before they list the name on their website as a victim. Basically, Dark Side believes that if they've attacked a company and they publicly announce it, that company's stock price will fall and they are willing to make deals with crooked market traders to short that company. And this could also be an extortion tactic as well. It is certainly clever. It is an interesting tactic. I wonder if it's gonna work. We'll see. Bruce Schneier shared a story about identifying people through lack of cell phone use. Basically, once upon a time, uh, French police were searching for an escaped criminal by looking for cell phones that were in the area and being actively used during the escape and then went silent afterwards. A lot of the time in the privacy community, we'll talk about don't use a phone or something like that. But it is important to keep in mind that that not using a phone can also be an identifier. Patterns can be an identifier. Like in this case, that's something that somebody had to actively look for. That wasn't something that they sent an AI to go do. But it's just something to be aware of, that the absence of something can be an identifier as well. An anti-vaxxer hijacked QR codes at COVID-19 check-in sites. <laughs> this was an interesting story. Somebody, I'm assuming, used stickers. And uh, when, I don't know if they were purposely going around to places or just as they went around to places. But, you know, a lot of places you go now, you have to check in with the QR code for contact tracing. And what they were doing is they were taking their own QR code and sticking it on top of that, car, uh, that QR code so that when people came in to go eat or whatever and they check in, instead of actually checking them in, it would take them to a, like one of those COVID is a hoax type websites. This story just highlights the security risk behind QR codes. You don't know what they do. They're just a little square box. You can't see that. You don't know what that link is. So be really careful of QR codes. Our next story is about Android malware. It, there is a Android malware called Flubot that is going around. Does your standard steals passwords, bank de details, other information. It spreads via SMS and claims to be a delivery company asking users to click on a link because you know there's an issue with your package or check on your package or whatever. Just a real quick reminder, be careful of phishing, be careful of phishing, be careful of phishing. Despite technology, despite how far we've come as a society technologically, phishing is still like the number one way to compromise the system. And especially nowadays where we're ordering things from home and we're all getting a lot of packages, just be so careful of that stuff. And finally, I'm gonna let you guys read this story on your, on your own. I just thought it was a really funny story and I wanted to share it with you guys. They found a remote code execution vulnerability in a smart air fryer. So remember, don't buy a smart device if you don't need it. If you do need it, get devices that actually get updated and no matter what, keep them on an isolated VLAN if you must connect them at all. Can you imagine the shame of having to tell your roommates or your partner that you guys got hacked because of your freaking air fryer? And that was all of our news for the last two weeks. That was a lot. Thank you guys so much for bearing with us. Don't forget, you can help keep this project going with a recurring Patreon donation. But of course, I understand sometimes your financial situation doesn't allow for that. So we also have other one-time donation methods. There's Monero, there's PayPal, there's a merch store, there's affiliate links. If you're going to buy something anyways, go see if maybe we have an affiliate link for it and we'll get a couple bucks for it. And of course, there's many other ways. It's all on the website. We want to thank you again for listening to The Surveillance Report. We are so happy to know that you are trying to stay safe out there. Last but not least, we want to ask you, share the podcast around. If you're on Apple Podcasts, leave a review. If you're on one of those websites that doesn't let you leave a review, share the episode. Make sure you subscribe. All that fun stuff. We're trying to reach as many people as possible with the message of privacy and stuff like that really does help. I know you hear it all the time on every single podcast, but it really does help. We promise. Thank you so much for listening. We will see you next week.